On August 24, 2001, an Airbus A330 operated by Air Transat, a Canadian airline, was en route over the Atlantic Ocean on its flight from Toronto to Lisbon, when it gradually ran out of fuel. Its engines stopped running one after the other while the aircraft was far away from the next available airport. Miraculously, the aircraft would be saved, but there would be an interesting twist to the story. Today, we are going to look at the sequence of events that led to the longest unpowered glide of an airliner in aviation history. Welcome to Airspace. It was around midnight on the 24th of August in 2001, when Air Transit Flight 236 was calmly cruising over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane had taken off in Toronto four hours earlier, and the flight was uneventful so far, until, during a routine check of the systems, the first officer discovered an odd indication for the right engine. All parameters were in their normal range, but somehow the oil temperature for the right engine showed up as only 65 degrees Celsius, while the left engine was at a more usual reading of 110 Celsius. Also, the right engine showed an oil pressure reading almost twice as high as the left engine. Please note that as we are looking at the plane from the front, the engine on the left is actually the one considered the right engine, since it is the right engine in the sense of flight. The pilots tried to make sense of these values, but were unable to diagnose what led to the significant discrepancy between the two values. You see, in pilot school, most pilots learn that a failing engine will often show high oil temperatures and low oil pressures, not the other way around. In an attempt to consult somebody more knowledgeable in technical terms, they contacted their maintenance department via radio. They too were baffled and unable to provide assistance. In the end, the crew concluded that most likely a faulty sensor or a computer problem could be the issue. This may sound a bit unprofessional, but believe me, faulty sensor reading happened more often than one might guess. Half an hour later, an advisory message showed up in the middle of the instrument panel. This is a white flashing box, only about 3 times 1 cm large, indicating that the parameter is still valid and in its normal range, but slowly drifting towards something abnormal. To understand the next sequence, one must know that fuel is stored in the wings of an airplane. The A330's fuel system is somewhat complex, but for the sake of this video, I will depict fuel as just being stored in the left and right tank. Additionally, fuel can also be stored in the horizontal stabilizer at the back of the aircraft or the center tank of the A330. In the case of Air Transat 236, the tail tank had been emptied and the center tank was not installed. The crew now checked the displayed advisory message and found that it indicated a fuel imbalance between the wings. The right wing tank now showed three tons less fuel than the left one. To counteract the imbalance, the crew decided to execute the fuel and balance checklist and connect the wing tanks via the so-called cross-feed valve. They increased fuel pressure on the side with more fuel and so expected to balance the fuel load. Shortly after these initial actions, the crew noticed that the remaining fuel on board was significantly below the planned quantity. Unfortunately, the A330 was at the time of development unable to issue any warnings related to fuel loss. Unknown to the crew, a fuel leak had developed in the right engine. The crew now decided to divert their plane to Lachaise, an airport on the island in the Azores. Also, the captain asked one of the cabin crew members to check the wings and the engines for a fuel leak. Unfortunately, the cabin crew member was unable to spot anything out of the ordinary, probably because it would have been very hard to see in the dark outside environment. Ten minutes later, the cockpit crew realized that their current fuel transfer setting was not making the situation better and decided to invert the fuel selection, now pumping fuel from the right wing to the left, in an attempt to salvage some fuel. At this time, the fuel leak had already persisted for an hour and 16 minutes, losing up to 13 tons of fuel per hour. Unfortunately, the pilots were unable to determine the origin of the fuel leak. I will tell you more about the origin of the leak in the end. It is quite an astonishing one. In an attempt to get help, the pilots contacted their maintenance department again, which suggested the possibility of a leak in the left engine. Acting on this information, the captain started to cross feed again from the left healthy tank into the right tank, which was leaking. 14 minutes later, at 6.13 am coordinated time, the right engine flamed out due to fuel starvation. 
At this time, the aircraft was still 150 miles away from Lages airport. Since the A330 cannot maintain cruising altitude with only one engine, the crew started to descend their plane. The first officer declared Mayday shortly after. At 6.26, 13 minutes after the first engine, the second engine flamed out as well. The aircraft was now at a position 65 nautical miles away from Lages, at an altitude of 34,500 feet. At this time, since the engines were no longer running, the plane deployed its ram air turbine, a small propeller held into the airstream that provides emergency electric and hydraulic power to maintain controllability of the plane. The cabin lights went dark. As the plane approached the island, the crew asked the air traffic controllers multiple times to flash the runway lighting in order to better find their intended runway. Eight minutes after the loss of the second engine, the aircraft arrived at the position 8 nautical miles from runway 33 at an altitude of still 13,000 feet. The Airbus manual suggests to be at about 4,800 feet, and from my own training, I recall the recommendation to arrive at this point between 4,800 and 7,200 feet. To lose some altitude, the captain decided to fly a 360 turn. Being still high and fast after that, he did not fly the approach in a straight line but with S-turns, a demanding maneuver for sure. During these turns, the aircraft was configured for landing. Only the leading edge slats, which do not massively slow down the aircraft, were deployable due to the loss of main hydraulic and electric power. The gear was lowered by gravity extension, which is a backup system to the normal hydraulic system. At 6.45, the aircraft crossed the runway threshold at a speed of 200 knots, which is about 370 km per hour or 230 miles per hour, and thereafter touched down hard, bounced back in the air and touched down hard a second time. The captain then applied full brake pressure. Having lost all hydraulic and electric power, this brake pressure came only from a hydraulic accumulator, which is just a fancy way of saying pressurized liquid container. Also, the anti-skid was unavailable due to the loss of electronics, which led to the aircraft blowing all main tires. The wheel rims were ground down almost to the axle, but the aircraft, having received substantial damage to the landing gear and the slightly creased fuselage from the strong impact, came to a safe stop after just about three quarters of the three kilometer long runway. After this, small fires started around the landing gear area, which were quickly put out by the fire crew in attendance. The captain ordered an emergency evacuation of the aircraft. Everyone survived the ordeal and even the aircraft was salvageable. It is still flying today. But what had caused the fuel leak in the first place? To answer that, we must go back to nine days before the accident. During a routine inspection of the aircraft, metal chips were found in the engine oil of the right engine, which is usually a sign of engine degradation. Two days later, a week before the incident flight, the aircraft was inspected again and again metal chips were found. It was decided that the engine needed to be changed. Because Air Transat did not have an engine at hand, they leased one from another company. During the engine change, it was discovered that these two engines were not in the same configuration. The one with the chips in it was already modified with an upgrade, while the leased engine was not. The lead engineer tried to access information on how to install this upgrade for the engine on his computer, but due to a network error at the time, he was unable to do so. He then consulted with a colleague who suggested that all he needed to do was to replace the hydraulic pump and to make it fit, he would need to install the modified fuel line taken from the engine with the chips in it. This unprofessionally executed maintenance task eventually led to an engine that was working properly. However, during each hour the engine operated, the new fuel line and the unmodified hydraulic lines rubbed against each other, chafing and thinning the material of the fuel line. This fuel line ruptured after 67 and a half hours of operation, somewhere over the Atlantic, leading to the fuel leak in Air Transat Flight 236. This leak also caused the odd temperature and pressure readings that the pilots detected in the beginning of the event. In airliners, engine oil is cooled by surrounding it with cold fuel. The highly increased fuel flow due to the fuel leak cooled the oil more than it normally would, making it thicker in the process, which led to the higher oil pressure. In the aftermath of the event, the pilots were given a hero's welcome at home. However, the investigation that followed showed that while their actions were brave and accurate with regard to their flying skill, 
The entire accident could have been avoided had they properly inspected their fuel system for a leak before executing the fuel imbalance checklist. This checklist suggests to first check for a leak and warns the user to execute the fuel leak checklist instead if a leak is suspected. Had it been executed instead, the aircraft could have easily reached Lachaise with one engine operating, which would have been much easier to handle. Air Transat was fined 250,000 Canadian dollars, which was the largest fine in commercial aviation at the time. The fuel imbalance checklist was changed after the incident to warn even more prominently of the possibility of fuel loss. Thanks everyone for watching. If you liked the video, please leave a like and consider to subscribe. Also, let me know in the comments down below what you would like me to cover next. See you in the next one.